hey everybody, welcome to Skype a Scientist Live. Today we're talking about fossils and all like what that job entails and how you can prepare fossils and uh, we're super, super excited. So um, today, uh, I, I think, what else do I have to tell you? Oh, next week, let's talk about what's happening next week. Um, later this week on Wednesday at 2 p.m. Eastern, we're gonna be talking about abalone, which are a type of snail. Um, they live in uh, California and are, the scientist that uh, works on them is all about rescuing these snails. So the, so the subject is snail rescue effectively. Um, tomorrow, we also have a super cool event happening at 3 p.m. Eastern and 8 p.m. Eastern called No Time Like the Presentation. We had 65 scientists submit 90 second videos explaining their work. And so then eight judges that were a mix of um, scientists and people who had nothing to do with science watch those videos and pick the ones that they thought were the uh, most easy to understand and entertaining. And then uh, based on all eight judges' results, we mix it together and then the 10 favorites from our group um, are going to be giving 10 minute presentations each. So the first uh, these scientists were from all over the world, so um, we're doing five at 3 p.m. and five at 8 p.m. because uh, if we did them all at the same time, somebody would be talking at like 2 a.m., and so that's not great. Um, so we separated into two, and that's uh, going to be tomorrow. You can find all the links on our website or uh, on our Twitter at uh, twitter.com slash Skype scientist. Um, and then Thursday, we've got trivia with Tyus uh, Williams. That's going to be awesome. He's super entertaining and energetic. Um, and that's for just adults. Um, and then next week, we're doing science at home, which is basically um, Dr. Tay is, is what she, her stage name. She's going to be taking us through um, all sorts of science experiments that you can do at home and how you can uh, do experiments from your kitchen. And then Tuesday, we're talking about vaccines. Um, and then Friday, we're talking all about mountains. Um, and with that, I think I'm gonna hand it over. Before I do that, please, just a quick reminder, we are a nonprofit organization working overtime during the pandemic and all the time to bring science to as many people as humanly possible. So if you can support our program, that would be amazing. You can do that at patreon.com slash Skype a scientist or uh, paypal.me slash Skype a scientist. Um, that is all for me, so take it away. Hi guys, uh, my name is Miria Perez and I'm a fossil preparator at the Perot Museum of Nature and Science in Dallas, Texas. And what does a fossil preparator do exactly? Well, we clean and take care of all of these fossils that um, are of all different ages, so like Ice Age mammals to dinosaurs, and we clean them in our lab, we glue them back together, we puzzle them, we do a whole bunch of different stuff to ensure that they stay kind of healthy, I guess. Uh, for researchers to come and many generations to come. So they, they are housed in our collection, so like long-term storage, and we make sure that they stay safe and healthy. Awesome. And I love this job because um, I've always loved paleontology, so I get that, and I love art and other sciences, and it's kind of a hodgepodge of all of these different art and science backgrounds in one, and it's hands-on, so that's a big plus for me. Awesome. So are you working with dinosaurs and like all sorts of other stuff too, like any fossil that comes in or do you specialize on one type of fossil? So it really depends on what our curators, the people who are doing the active research at the museum are working on. Uh, right now we have a lot of Alaskan dinosaurs from the Cretaceous period that we're working on. Um, so that's our, um, all the fossils that we have in the lab right now are from that time period. But we also have donors that come in, they have fossils that we accept and we want to keep in our collections. Like we have this little mammal, um, it's called an oreodont. It's a very small kind of burrowing animal. And we have that in, sitting in our lab uh, getting prepared as well. So we've kind of got a mixture. Awesome. Um, so what kind of questions are you trying to answer with your job? Wow, so we, our, our primary job is to get that fossil out of the rock. So unlike Jurassic Park, where you see, you know, it's laid out, there's a beautiful raptor skeleton, it's all just put together and nice and neatly. We actually, in real life, you would take that fossil, but it would be encased in a lot of rock. 
Um, so you saw them kind of dusting and picking away at the bone. That is actually done in the lab for the most part because you want to look under magnification and just make sure you're not breaking any fossils as best you can. Um, so we do, we do that in the lab and break away the fossils. Awesome. McKinley would like to know, how do you clean them? How do we clean them? That's a great question. Um, it depends. So if the rock is super hard, we use this really cool um, technique with an air scribe, and that is a vibrating needle on this little pin, and it's, uh, used pneuma it uses pneumatic air, and it sounds kind of like a dentist drill, and so it buzzes away the rock, and it chips and, you know, rocks and pieces fly everywhere, so you gotta wear a mask. So that's a little bit for um, fossils that are more difficult to get out of the rock. And then for things that are in kind of a sandy dirt kind of texture, like really easy to clean off, we use dental picks. Um, one of the coolest tools that I've used is a porcupine quill uh, to take away the dust and the dirt off the fossil because it won't scratch the bone. That's super cool. Um, Sarah Keeler would like to know, do you have a favorite dinosaur? Oh, it changes. It always changes. I love them all. Um, my favorite childhood dinosaur was Parasaurolophus. It's got this long crest. It's kind of known as the trombone lizard. And then right now, I think there's a really cool dinosaur that reminds me of Wolverine um, from Marvel, and it's called Therizinosaurus. <laughs> do, do you know this dinosaur? I do. I do. This, I just said Wolverine. I was like, she's got to be talking about that. Like, yeah, that one. That's yeah. awesome. Um, I only know about, a lot of what I've learned about dinosaurs, honestly, I've learned from my buddy Dustin, because I focus on invertebrates for so long. I like, I was really, really into dinosaurs as a kid, and then I saw a cuttlefish for the first time, and that was that was the end of that. I like that was it really it. Yeah. switched to squid. Um, but yeah, I've learned about that dinosaur and many others. Uh, and Parasaurol, para that animal. Okay, anyway, Andrea, I would like to know, if you were to find a fossil that's broken, how would you repair it? Yes, so we often receive fossils that are broken in our lab. Sometimes it, you know, fossils break in the lab. It happens. It does not feel good, but we have the special um, variety of reversible glue and you dissolve it in acetone and that's the same stuff you can use to get rid of your nail polish and I really need to do that right now. Um, so you can make it as thick or as thin glue as you need. So things that are kind of crumbling and falling apart, you just put a little bit of glue on that and it keeps the fossil from crumbling. And then for broken pieces, you get kind of a thicker glue and you make sure you balance those two pieces that are broken you just glue it on and you wait for 30 minutes. That's, that's easy. That's great. Um, <laughs> Raphael would like to know, how long does it take for an animal to fossilize? Oh, okay. So this is a very good question. Um, it can take, I think it depends on the environment, but that is a good question. There's a time frame where fossils are not fossils. So there are actually some extinct mammal bones that are not technically fossilized. Um, and I need to double check the date on that for you. Can I get back to you on that? Sure, yeah. <laughs> Saying I don't know is perfectly acceptable. Like, scientists do not know everything, and that is okay. Um, I don't know everything about squid, uh, even though I know a lot about them. So it's just, yeah, it's totally fine. Um, J-Rob would like to know, uh, where do you think you find the most fossils? The most fossils? Hmm. I mean, they're, they are all over the world, and there's different kinds depending on um, certain rock outcrops. So fossils are found in certain layers of rocks and certain rock layers are exposed in certain places all over the world. So you can find fossils in Texas, you can find fossils in Europe, even in Antarctica there are fossils. Um, so I'm not, I don't know what the best place to find fossils are because you can find them anywhere and depending on how easy or hard it is depends on accessibility of the land how hard the rock is, how easy it is to find the fossils. So I'm not sure how to, I hope that answers a little bit of your question, but yeah, yeah. they're found all over the place. Great, yeah, that's, that's awesome. Um, C Camp would like to know, uh, what happens to the dust and rock that you scrape off of the fossil? Yeah, so um, we make sure that there's no fossil bits that we wanna keep and anything that's important, uh, we have to throw it away because we can't keep all the dirt. Now at the Pro Museum, that's what we do because we, that's kind of what the dirt is situation there is at that museum. But um, in past labs that I've worked at, so at my university, 
we actually had to burn the dirt um, because it was from Angola and there's some rules about like mold and, and spores from different plants that you have to make sure there's no invasive species that come from that. So we actually had to keep all that dirt and then have it go and be burned. Uh -huh. um, and then at the Houston Museum, we actually kept all of the dirt um, that we were working on and then we sifted through it. So we put it in some cheesecloth and we ran a water hose to make sure there were no microfossils, like small teeth, little vertebrae, little pieces of backbone, um, and rib bits. That's yeah. awesome. What a, what a cool answer. That's great. Good question, uh, whoever asked that. Uh, I think it was J-Rob. Uh, Sarah B. would like to know, do you know of any volunteer opportunities to get to where you are? Yes. So the reason I got into my job right now is because I was a volunteer for so long. Um, any natural history museum most likely will have a volunteer program. And what I've learned is you gotta be persistent. So if you really are interested in volunteering, get in contact with their volunteer services and the paleontology department, maybe a curator or somebody who works in the lab and push for it. So I actually started out as a junior volunteer at the Houston Museum when I was 12. And even though the minimum age was 14, I had pushed and wanted it so bad. They were like, all right, as long as you bring your mother, you can come in and volunteer. And so I spent almost every weekend there and my poor mom had to drive me into through Houston traffic almost every weekend, but it was a lot of fun and I gained a lot of experience and it's so worth it. That's great. What a supportive mom. That's wonderful. Yeah. wonderful. Um, let's see, Teddy wants to know, what dinosaur do you wish everybody knew about? Ooh. Ooh, that's a really awesome question. Yeah. And I haven't thought about it. What, what dinosaur? So if I could pick something instead of T-Rex in Jurassic World, I think a really cool dinosaur would maybe be some sort of Carnotaurus or Abelosaur. They look like T-Rex, but they have even stubbier arms and they have a big butt <laughs> and got horns and then they're really cool looking. Awesome. Good answer. Um, upside Down Man would like to know, do fossils ever get stolen? Yes, that happens. And we try to avoid that. We always talk, especially in the lab, we go through with our volunteers and they go through a training process and they understand that, you know, even sometimes you can't even take pictures in the lab, depending on the fossils that are in there. Um, so we make sure that our volunteers know the importance of having fossils in the museum versus in your house um, because then the world can't see the scientific dis discoveries. So I think our volunteers know that pretty well and we, tr we do trust our volunteers a lot. So we don't have that happen often, at least to my knowledge, <laughs> right. but it does happen and it's very unfortunate. But I think most of our volunteers, actually all of them, they understand the importance of the fossils being in that lab and being in that museum. Great. Um, Liz would like to know, have you ever worked with an ankylosaurus tail slash club? Ooh, that would be so cool. My little ankylosaurus right here. Oh. I have not worked on ankylosaurus before. I've seen fossils around, but I have not personally worked on him. But that would be definitely something I would want to do in the future. Very cool. Um, Ashley Oki wants to know, have you ever started working on a fossil and it turned out to be another animal? And how do you figure out what something is? That's awesome. So uh, we kind of guess depending on the number of animals that have been found there previously. So for our lab, we know most of those bones are coming from an animal called Pachyrhinosaurus. Oh, I should have brought my model here. But he looks like Triceratops, but he's got a very, very big bump on the front of his snout instead of the three horns like Triceratops does. And um, Pachyrhinosaurus, they have very beefy, large bones. And so when you find something else, they tend to be a little bit different in shape, def definitely different in size. Um, so you kind of look at texture, shape, and size, um, not so much color, because they can kind of be the same. But for instance, we had, you know, we find dinosaurs from a small tyrannosaur animal in that, in that mixture, and they have different bones, like the bones are thinner, and they have different shapes to them. So you kind of look at the shape of the shape of them more or less. Cool. Awesome. Um, let's see. Cadence would like to know, uh, where do you find most of the fossils? Do you personally go out and get them or is, is it like different teams that do different things? 
Sure. So we actually have a lot of fossils in the DFW area, the Dallas Fort Worth area where I where I am currently. And so we actually last summer got called out to go rescue an extinct turtle fossil out in the creek bed. So uh, we had a weekend where we took some of our, our volunteers and all of our lab staff and we went out and we got that. So it's sitting in our collections ready to be prepped. Awesome. Um, but all of our Alaska material is a very, very small crew. Um, I have not been out there. It sounds amazing and very tough sometimes because it's in just kind of the middle of nowhere, Alaska. And they only have maybe four, five, six people out there. And it's very difficult conditions mm -hmm. um, and expensive to send. So I haven't been out there, but that's where all, most of our fossils in our lab come from. But every once in a while, we get to go out and excavate around the local area. Super cool. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the If Then STEM ambassadorship program? Yes. So If Then is if she can, then she can become a scientist. So if she sees somebody in a role, in a STEM role, then she can become a, a paleontologist or an you know, astrophysicist. And we are working to become role models for girls and women and any, really anybody all over the world through social media, through things like Skype a Scientist to share our stories, to show that you can do it. You can become a scientist. And hey, I'm a scientist. I don't have a PhD and math is hard, but I'm still able to be a scientist. And I hope that I can inspire other people if they're interested in it, in it as well. Awesome, thanks. Um, let's see, uh, Lindsay would like to know how many fossilized dinosaurs have you uncovered? Have I uncovered, oh my goodness, dozens. Uh, so in terms of individual dinosaurs, I'm not sure. Um, and sometimes we can't be sure because all those bones are kind of jumbled up together. But I'm countless, countless fossils. I've done um, Tyrannosaur teeth. I've done these uh, ichthyosaur fossils. I've puzzled back. Do you, are you, do you like ichthyosaurs? I like anything <laughs> in the water, honestly. So oh, yeah, ichthyosaurs are super cool. They look like uh, dolphins, kind of, yeah. and uh, mosasaurs. So if you're familiar with Jurassic World, that thing that jumps out of the water, lots of mosasaur fossils. I did a lot of mosasaur um, material. And then Demetrodon, he's the guy with the sail on its back. Not a dinosaur, but still super cool. Uh -huh. Yeah, and Pachyrhinosaurus. Very cool. Um, Kay Kneer would like to know, uh, how do you prepare dino dung? Dino dung? Ooh, I've never done dino dung before. Really? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know how to prepare dino, dino dung. What's the scientific word for dino dung? Coprolite. 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 Oh, oh coprolite. <laughs> you can learn from coprolites. You can learn a lot of things. You can learn about what those dinosaurs ate. And that's super important because then you can, you can know for sure this animal ate this animal. Um, I can tell you that the coprolite that I've worked on, it's not dinosaur, but it's shark poop from the Permian period in Texas. Um, they have bits of fish bones and bits of fish scales inside, and you can see the lovely shape that it makes. And those don't actually require a whole lot of prep because they just kind of pop out of the rock. Um, but yeah, you can um, of animals too. Like if they're eating something on land, but they're an aquatic animal, you're knowing that that animal has to come out of the water or maybe that animal is nearby the water and is eating that other, other animal. <laughs> right. Awesome. Um, Kathleen would like to know, uh, do you work on any plant fossils and are, are they harder or easier to work with compared to animal fossils? I have never personally worked on plant fossils, but that is soon to change. We did, we do have a paleobotanist at the Perot Museum that is hoping to collect some plant fossils to show us how to prep. Um, it's a lot different from what she's described. So you actually take, you have this concretion of you hope has plants. And you know this because of the certain um, rocks that they're contained in. And she takes actually a large hammer and whacks it and it'll separate. And you don't really have to do a whole lot of prep after that, I believe, depending on the plant. But it separates and opens because the plant inside provides kind of a separ a natural separation. And it oh, pops out. Wow, so cool. Um, Russ would like to know, what is the most underrated discovery in paleontology of the last decade? Ooh, underrated. So 
Uh, I think a lot of you, if you're interested in paleontology, are probably familiar with that Spinosaurus tail paper that came out. There were actually a lot of other things that came out very close to that that have not gotten the press I think they deserve. There was a new Cretaceous mammal discovered and named that is super cool and everybody should check out that kind of got, you know, hidden away from the Spinosaurus. There's also a new Ceratopsian dinosaur called Stellosaurus that was named. And I think they should also be getting some press too. I mean, I think they did, but Spinosaurus is big and bad and a meat eater, so everybody wants to know about that. But yeah. the mammal and Stellosaurus are pretty cool as well. Awesome. Um, Ashley would like to know, I've seen some cleaning of fossils in labs, and they always seem to be covered in some kind of paper towel material. Is that plaster? Yeah, so paper towels are, they act as a separator between the fossil and what's called the fossil jacket. And the jacket is the white material that you'll usually, usually will see encased around the fossil to keep it supported and um, keep it kind of together. It was also used to help it trans to transport it from field to lab. Um, and the toilet paper is that separator. Sometimes you wanna put it, kind of shove it in maybe something that's not as stable. Like if you're working on kind of a larger area and some of the rock is falling apart, you may wanna kind of support it with some toilet paper or uh, paper towel. So yeah, we use toilet paper or paleontological paper as we like to call it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, Raphael would like to know, how cold was Antarctica during the dinosaur period? Oh, actually, I believe it was warm. Um, we have a lot of kind of warmer plants and dinosaurs happening. Antarctica wasn't at the bottom of, the, of our Earth during that Cretaceous period time. Um, as far as temperature, I can't give you an exact temperature, um, but I can tell you that Alaska during the Cretaceous period was uh, a little bit above freezing, so it was warmer um, back then than it was today, than it is today. And there may have been snow around that area, but not directly where the dinosaurs were. Awesome. Um, how did you become interested in fossils? I don't know. I caught fossil fever like every kid did, and it just never went away. Um, I loved dinosaur books. I wanted to be a dinosaur. I played with, I think the first Barbie I ever got was maybe 16 and it was a paleontologist Barbie. So I've awesome. always played with dinosaurs and been interested. Went to the local Houston Museum and I, I just, I always loved it. Very cool. Um, it's, it was also like just such a thing in the like early to mid 90s. Uh, like yeah. such a cultural moment, loving dinosaurs. Um, Hannah would like to know, what's your favorite fossil that you've ever worked on? Mm, favorite fossil? Oh, okay. My favorite fossil was a skull of Pachyrhinosaurus. And the reason it was my favorite is because I was using a scribe and I was looking at the nasal boss. I was working on the front part, which is super gnarly. It's where the horns would be on the Triceratops, but instead for Pachy. Mm -hmm. And it's full of grooves and dips and little pockets. So it's really fun to go in and prep and you get kind of in a groove and it's very therapeutic and you know the texture when to stop. And it's just kind of a very soothing, it's like coloring, but prepping. Uh -huh. And I think that was my favorite thing to work on because it was just this huge chunk of nasal boss. It was a huge chunk of just going through and kind of reading the, the rock and reading the fossils. And that was a lot of fun for me. That's super cool. Um, that sounds like such a lovely experience. Um, I think people don't realize how much like some parts of science are just like sitting by yourself and like art, arty, like art adjacent. I know when I was preparing slides for the microscope when I was a tech before grad school, there's this. Uh, device called the microtome. And so you take uh, basically little bits of, of animal and then you put it in wax and then you're slicing so the wax gets sliced super thin, like itsy bitsy wow. teeny tiny. And um, the whole room smells like crayons basically. And <laughs> there's like flowing water that helps take that little slice that basically, if you wanna like look into an organ and take a little slice of it and see what's in there you, for the microscope, you do that. And the little wax and tissue like floats down a little waterfall and then floats in a little pond. And it's just like the, the little trickling water noises with the crayon smells and the room is dim. And it's just like so lovely. And I think people, <laughs> 
think of science as more hardcore and it's just like sometimes science is just lovely um and that fossil experience sounds so similar yeah you just kind of you get in a rhythm and it just becomes a happy place yeah totally i get it um Raphael would like to know how old is the oldest dinosaur oh the oldest dinosaur so the triassic period is when dinosaurs first started becoming a thing um there was a big big extinction event actually the biggest the permian triassic extinction and that is kind of the mark of the death of maybe 95 percent of all life going extinct and then the rise of dinosaurs started happening during the very early triassic period cool um ashley would like to know this is a funny question uh weird question uh what happens if you sneeze when you're working on something will you chip something spray dust slash bacteria everywhere like what happens <laughs> so um sneezing and a mask is very uncomfortable and so anytime i get close to sneezing i put everything down and i open my mask because sneezing in a mask is really gross um, but yeah, you can get distracted and sometimes things can chip if you know you sneeze or you hiccup and things get chipped. You just try maybe to lift your hand before as if you can feel it coming as best you can. Um, but yeah, and dust is blowing everywhere from your air scribe and it, it, it can be pretty dirty. I'll come home and just like shake my hair out and it's just dust yes. everywhere. But oh, yeah, sometimes it can get scratched. Oh, we call, we call it a discovery mark. If you are just working in kind of a section of rock and you don't know what's in there and you hit bone and sometimes, you know, you, you mark it and hopefully it's not in a spot that is super important. Um, right. Once you hit that and it's like, oh, okay, we made a discovery mark. Now we know not to go here. Right. Sounds good. Um, when you have a skull, how do you clean out the inside? Um, are you able to use the same tools or are there weird angles and passages that you have to get through? Um, a lot of the times we won't dig um, deep and kind of pull, kind of get that cavity out. Um, that will maybe compromise the structure of that fossil as a whole. So we'll make a decision whether to clean, how far to clean it out. So for the holes, like for the eye sockets, you actually don't want to go too far in there at least for our stuff, um, because you risk the fossil breaking and it's already supported by that rock. So you maybe decide to leave it in. Mm -hmm. um, and we use air scribes to clean, to clean it out. So as long as you define certain like um, foramina, so places where blood vessels and nerves can go through, if you defi define that circle or that little area, that's usually enough. And so we try not to, we don't remove, as, we don't remove too much material. Yeah, the goal is to keep the fossil safe and um, sturdy more than to kind of expose everything, if that makes sense. I hope that makes sense. That totally makes sense, yeah. Um, we've got two questions from two different people, but they're related. What's the biggest dinosaur and what's the smallest dinosaur? Ooh, the biggest dinosaur would be some sort of long neck dinosaur, a sauropod. And the smallest dinosaur, hmm. Archaeopteryx is pretty small, but I believe there's something else out there that's smaller than that. A tiny little theropod dinosaur, maybe. I'll check on that too. I'm gonna say okay. I don't know. That's fine. Good names. Yeah, cool. Um, let's see. So Amanda would like to know, how do you figure out what the animal looks like just from its bones? We have noses that you wouldn't know about, so how can you tell? Yeah. There's a lot of stuff, like if you look at a chicken skeleton, you're missing all of the fancy feathers and the little wa the waddle and everything. We don't know. Um, we try to make our, our, our guesses as accurate as possible. We estimate as much as we can. Some critters, we, we know a lot, like we have skin impressions of ichthyosaurus having a tail fluke, which is super cool. Same with mosasaurus. Uh -huh. um, Animals like uh, Rampharynchus, which is this flying pterosaur, has a little diamond at the end of its tail because we have soft tissue preservation. Cool. But yeah, like we, we guess because we look at um, muscle attachments on the bone, so how big the scarring is on the bone, so the different textures on there, we can say, okay, it definitely had a very large chewing muscle or so it's probably maybe it had really big cheeks because of the different scarring on the muscles. And we could do a lot of comparative anatomy to present day animals, but yeah, some of it can be left to the imagination. 
Cool. Related to that question, um, Ashley wants to you to please address feathers and non-bones and how they even fossilize and why does it sometimes happen and sometimes not? Yeah, so um, fossil feathers, it, yeah, it depends on the deposition environment. It depends on where that animal was when it died and was it left alone? Did dirt cover it really quickly? So for feathers, we have a site in Germany, and it's very famous. It's called Solenhofen, Germany. And that area was what's called a Lagerstatten, a very kind of, uh, no, very little oxygen at the bottom of this very stagnant water pool. And so when animals died, they got buried with fine, sil like fine layers of dirt, and nothing was down there to scavenge it, and so it was left alone. And so the feathers were actually left and you know impressions and even a little bit of that feather material um, is found. So the actual feathers are actually preserved in that, not just impressions. And so that environment leads to preserving feathers, which is super cool. And we get to learn a lot from that. And then animals like maybe some raptor skeletons that had, you know, their feathers weren't preserved. There was, the water was running when they were dead in that creek. And the reason we know some of them have feathers is on their arms, um, like birds, there's these little notches where the feathers attach, and you can see that in some raptors. So we oh, do know that they have feathers. <laughs> that's great. Um, Sarah Keeler would like to know, um, have you ever worked with a stigmolic? Does that ring a bell? Oh, okay, okay, great. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but... <laughs> it's, um, are you familiar with Pachycephalosaurus? Yes. It's a kind of a relative of that. They're, they have these fancy dome shaped heads. I have not. Um, I've worked, I've had a cast of Draco Rex that I got to kind of parade around for a special event. So I got to hold that. That was super cool. But I haven't prepped any um, pachycephalosaurs or any of that group yet. Cool. Um, let's see. Have you ever found a velociraptor? No, I haven't find, found a velociraptor. That would be really cool. Yeah. Um, I, oh, man. I can't say anything, but I will say, be on the lookout for a new paper from the Perot Museum. Cool. That's that all I'll say. Good. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Lindsay would like to know, how long does it take to clean off a fossil? Oh, that's a good question. Um, it can take a day. It can take months. And um, I think removing, taking the jacket of just solid rock and having all these little bits of fossils in here depending on how many people are working on it. Um, our jackets usually take maybe a couple of months to completely clear out that, that jacket. The one that I've been working on up until this pandemic, I mean, that thing has been worked on for at least a year plus. So sometimes it can take a very long time. Very cool. Um, Hannah says, I'm six years old. How can I become a scientist? Yes. How do you become a scientist? I want you to just follow your passion, keep reading, keep watching videos, do, do art, like find a mentor that you can ask questions if you have them come up. So um, what I would suggest doing is if you have a paleontologist hero in mind, send them an email, ask your questions, introduce yourself. And you putting your question out here is already a good sign. Like keep looking for support in the field, and you will go places. Awesome advice. Um, Amadeo would like to know, uh, what type of school do you have to go to to become a fossil prep, uh, prep person? Sure. Um, so uh, for your undergraduate degrees, um, usually you'll do biology or geology. That's kind of the typical route for a paleontologist, either a researcher or a prep, uh, prep person. If you want to do fossil prep, I would highly suggest getting involved at your local museum and start getting experience now. It's a lot of fun. You can figure out what you like about it, what you don't like about it. Um, yeah, and so I would get your degrees in biology, geology, but if you wanna be a volunteer, you don't have to have any of those requirements. You can just go in and volunteer and enjoy, enjoy that. But yeah, get experience by volunteering. Awesome. Um, Raphael would like to know, how do you name the dinosaurs? Yeah, so it depends on what you're feeling that day. Some people like to usually want to follow kind of the traditional route. So you use Greek or Latin words. So dinosaurs, you can kind of decode them actually. So Tyrannosaurus rex is tyrant. 
lizard is Saurus, and then king, Rex, that's Latin. And um, Saurus, like, that's lizard, so you can apply that to everything. Doesn't mean everything's a lizard, but um, yeah, you can use that. So Pachyrhinosaurus is a thick-nosed lizard. And then that last part, the species name, is usually what people rename stuff, because usually the, the genus or the large group of those animals has already been named, but you can name that species. And so that species is Peroorum, Pero, Pero Museum, and you just make it a little fancy. Uh, yeah, so really, you can make, name it macaroni and cheese thesaurus if you want, <laughs> if you're the scientist that decides what it is. Right. Uh, Draco Rex Hogwartsia, after like, Harry Potter, is actually a real dinosaur name that was named by a paleontologist, and he loves Harry Potter. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, how can you tell if a dinosaur was sick? You can actually, and not like the common cold. You can't really tell if they have like that kind of disease, but you can tell if they have a bone disease or if they get a broken bone and they heal over and they heal from that, or if they have a brain tumor, you can see that in the fossil. Um, sometimes the bone will heal or there'll be a really ugly mass of just kind of gnarly bones. So something's going on. Something's not right. There's a pathology there. Um, arthritis. So we have a dinosaur at our lab that looks like it could have arthritis. The knuckle area where it connects with the other bones, super gnarly, and it looks so painful. Poor guy. <laughs> and it's got these grooves very similar to what bones look like when, you, when we have arthritis. It's cool to think that an animal so different from us from so long ago could have like the same afflictions that your grandma has. Like that's, that's wild. Um, Cool. So let's see. Okay, we're, we're okay on time. We have time for a couple more. Um, so what sort of preservation do you have to do for fossils? Um, and are the oils from human skin damaging at all? So for our fossils, there it's rock. Um, you don't have to worry about putting your hands on it. The oils will not damage these fossils. Uh, for something very delicate, you probably want to be more careful, um, but we're not worried about skin being on there unless you were wanting to do something very special with it, but probably not. Um, yeah, your oils won't damage the fossils. I wear gloves because there's a lot of oil that actually comes off the scribe and that kind of gets everywhere and you get it on your hands. Plus, it's really dirty. But yeah, we won't, you can't damage it. That's good. Um, have you ever uncovered any underwater dinosaurs? underwater dinosaurs. I have done a lot of prep and a lot of work on fossils, not dinosaurs, but marine reptiles. Mm -hmm. I like, you can call them underwater dinosaurs, kind of. Um, they're maybe related, but uh, yeah, mosasaurs, so that thing from Jurassic World that ate the shark. Um, not, they're not quite as big as those animals, but lots of different kinds uh, of species of those animals. Some of them had these really weird mushroom looking teeth that they used to crunch shells like clam shells uh, during the Cretaceous period. Some of them had really thin sharp teeth for eating fish and faster moving underwater creatures. Yeah, so I did a lot of work on those. And then ichthyosaurs, the little dolphin reptile looking animal, I've done work on those. And we actually did um, research on those animals, on how they died, and what that burial process looked like. Very cool. Um, I had a question here that was good. Where'd it go? Um, well, in the meantime, what's the biggest fossil you've ever worked on? The biggest fossil? Hmm. A lot of my fossils, oh, okay. We did put uh, a Tyrannosaurus rex skeleton together when I was volunteering at the Houston Museum. So I think that's the biggest guy that I've worked on really is putting that mount together on display at the Sugarland Museum in Houston. Awesome. Very cool. Uh, Liz would like to know, how do the fossils get to you? Do you fly them from Alaska? Does a huge crate arrive with a giant rock in it? Uh, or is it like a bunch of loose dirt that you have to sift through? Um, all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> Um, sometimes uh, pieces like chunks of bone will be put into those Home Depot tubs and wrapped in some toilet paper and put in there. Bigger things um, like the big jackets where you've got just chunks of bone lying in there, those are helicoptered out of that area and then put onto a truck and then driven all the way from Alaska to Dallas. Wow. 
That's yeah. Cool. <laughs> um, all right. So our time for questions is up. So we always like to wrap this up by asking uh, everybody the same two questions. The first question is, what's something that you wish everybody in the world knew about your area of expertise? And then the second question is, what is someone, something that you wish everybody in the world knew about literally anything? It can be as small uh, or significant as you'd like. Oh, okay. Um, so something I wish people knew about my field is that you don't have to be the best at math. You don't have to be the best at school. And there was a lot of pressure. I had a lot of self pressure about that. Um, and being extremely just, you have to make all A's, um, to be in science. And it's not cut out for me if I don't, you know, make an A in everything not true. You can contribute to science in so many ways. In fossil prep, you can use art and all of these amazing things. Um, so science is for you if you want, if you're curious about the natural world. So science is, can be for anybody. And then something that I wish people knew a little bit more about, I'm going to say Permian amphibians. So there's this really cool guy called Diplocollis, and it's got this, I really want you guys to look it up. It's so cute. It's got a boomerang shaped head. It's got these two little eye sockets. That's the cutest thing. And I wish awesome. people knew more about that guy. <laughs> That's a great answer. Awesome. Um, okay, where can we find you online? Sure. Um, so you can follow me on Instagram if you search Miria Perez. There's not very many of Miria's out there. Um, my handle is Paleontologica. And so Miria might be an easier one to find. Uh -huh. But yeah, if you just type my name, add me on Instagram or Twitter, and I am open if you have any questions on how to get in the field, or I can answer those questions I wasn't able to answer. I can ask my colleagues and, and post about those. But yeah. Very cool. Well, thank <laughs> you so much for taking the time uh, to be with us today. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to plug before we wrap up? Um, yeah, if you guys come to the Pro Museum, let me know and I can show you the lab. Awesome. Uh, all right. Well, thanks so much for taking your time. This was so awesome. I learned so much. This is great. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you, Erin, for signing for us. That was amazing. And I know it is really early uh, in Portland right now. So you are a champion. Um, and uh, let's see, other housekeeping. We've got a lot of great stuff happening this week. Tomorrow, we've got no time like the presentation, which, which, uh, the most understandable, engaging 10 scientists out of a group who all submitted uh, for this like kind of game we're playing um, are gonna be presenting tomorrow uh, at 3 p.m. Eastern and 8 p.m. Eastern, five at three, five at eight. Um, it's gonna be cool, interesting talks all about their work. Each one's only 10 minutes long, so it's, you don't need to sit for too long. Um, and uh, you, can, you have the opportunity to ask them questions at the end of their talks as well. So that's gonna be cool. And then we're gonna talk about endangered snail rescue on Wednesday, 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, and then next week, Monday, we've got uh, science that you can do from home. Uh, and then vaccines on Tuesday, and then something else. Oh, mountains on Friday, next Friday, the 22nd. Um, you can always find all that sort of information, all links, whatever you need at skypeascientist.com. You can also donate to help support our program. We're a nonprofit, uh, and we have uh, one full-time staff member, that's me, and then we're trying to get another full uh, part-time staff member because this program is getting bigger by the minute. Um, so if you can support us at patreon.com slash Skype a scientist or paypal.me slash Skype a scientist, we totally rely on uh, your support to exist. Um, that's it. I hope, uh, thank you again, uh, Miria and Erin, and I hope to see you all soon. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>